So welcome. It's the last session of the day, so a bit tired everybody, I think. But um, I think this will be interesting. It's a, it's a nice uh, session where I try to um, explain and, and you know, present to you all the new features that have happened uh, between Java 11 and Java 17, and a little bit of what happened between 8 and 11. And we'll see maybe even a little bit more what uh, the future uh, of Java uh, will bring to us, which, uh, you know, it's fairly interesting to me and uh, I think for all of you as well. So before we even start, um, how many of you are still on Java 8? Raise hands. So I see about one third of the audience. Who's already in Java 11? Ah, good, good, a good half. Okay, so who's in Java 17 already? A uh, few hands, okay, cool. So uh, it's gonna be interesting. For those that are, of you that are still on Java 8 and Java 11, I'll try to make an argument to you know, let you move to 17, because it's, uh, it's really exciting. So my name is uh, Simone. I work for a company called Webtide. It's the company that provides services and support for the Jetty open source project. And um, I, my daily job is fundamentally web protocols, HTTP 1, HTTP 2, HTTP 3, WebSocket, and uh, everything related to making those protocols performant. So typical, I. You know, we work on JVM, garbage collectors, trading, and, and everything related to the performance uh, stuff of these protocols. So let's start with Java 11 first. And uh, it came out already like four years ago. Seems like, what, really? I mean, it's, Java 11 is just, it's like the new thing, but it's already four years old. Um, but before we even arrive to Java 11, it's like, okay, what, what did we inherit from Java 8 to 11? So we got, obviously, the mostly hated JPMS uh, uh, module system in Java. We got this uh, nice um, factory methods for uh, the collections, so you now can do list of, map of, etc., which is really nice to use, uh, var handles. We have, in Java, since Java 9, we have uh, Java Util Concurrent Flow, which is fundamentally reactive streams uh, and the reactive stream interfaces brought into the JDK. Um, there's a reason for that because they are actually used in the JDK itself, but it's a nice thing because uh, it means that the JDK fundamentally embraced uh, some kind of uh, reactiveness in it, and so you can now use these interfaces. Um, there's also a nice feature called uh, multi-release jars. It's an interesting feature which I think it's uh, very rarely used. It allows you to fundamentally write a class for one specific version of Java. So if you want to use a different API that are only available for, say, in Java 10 or starting from Java 10, you can write a multi-jar uh, release, uh, multi-release jar, that contains classes for Java 9, but also special classes for Java 10 and further so that you can actually use the new APIs. Um, another thing that was uh, quite controversial when, when it exited uh, was the uh, var uh, type. Um, this was uh, kind of came out of some kind of uh, poll with the Java community at the time. Scala was like a big language and Kotlin was coming out and, and everything. They had this var uh, way of declaring variables. And uh, Java said, okay, let's make a poll and let's see if people like var. And obviously everybody, yeah, yeah, var is a really good idea. It just was, uh, you know, maybe on, on the wave of this electricity that came through these other languages that var was introduced into Java, and it came, uh, if you go and, and go back and look at the um, uh, Java enhancement proposal that came with var, it came with, I think, something like uh, a manual for actually using uh, var, which was, I don't know, something like 10 pages long, and it was like, what well, was supposed to be such a simple feature? And it's like, well, why do, do I now need a 10 pages manual in order to use var in the proper places? So, eh, sometimes, some things are really good, some things are eh, but you know, it's, uh, it's an evolution anyway. 
uh, Docker awareness, because we are now fundamentally in a cloud environment almost all the times, and uh, the Java didn't support uh, container environments. It was not really uh, you know, possible. That speaks a long uh, story about the fact that the Java engineers uh, and those that shape the Java platform uh, really care and really listen to the community in order to, you know, st steward Java uh, forward. So it's, you know, mostly, mostly, I would say, a wonderful job. I, I could not ask for more. Um, what happened after Java 8 is that Oracle decided, well, okay, um, let's change this whole thing. We cannot afford anymore to do major releases every five years like it happened between Java 7 and Java 8. Uh, we take something completely different. We take a six months major release uh, train schedule. And uh, so there was Java 8, six months after that there was Java 9, and then uh, Java 10, and then 11, and then and so on and so forth, right? So every six months we have a release. Um, Java 11 was named as long-term support release. We will see uh, later uh, what this exactly means. Um, but for now, just remember this term, long-term support. Uh, it's important because fundamentally gives some you know, to certain releases of Java, it gives some kind of uh, more importance to them. Um, and, and therefore, you know, you have to pay attention to those. Um, my experience in migrating from Java 8 to 11, or, you know, to 9, to 10, to 11, and so on and so forth, is fundamentally the following. I've done it like multiple times, and the story goes as follows. 8 to 9 is kind of a something that you need to pay attention for. It is, it may be something that you just do in one hour, or it could be something that it, you know, takes a much longer time and then you have to start planning for it, like real planning, like you have to, you know, set up a Gantt, you have to say, okay, uh, to the developer, change all the code, uh, drop all the dependencies, update all the Maven plugins that you're using in the build tools, uh, update all the libraries to the newer version of, um, uh, you know, the latest versions, and, uh, you know, run everything into the uh, CI environment. Do we have any test failure? Uh, there's something, some behavioral change that everything compiles, but somehow behaves differently. So it's a breaking change in a way, but not really a compile breaking change, but still we have to take care of it because the product doesn't work anymore. So eight to nine could be some work. Going to 11 also requires less work than eight to nine, but a little bit of work as well because uh, they have removed from the JDK itself a bunch of classes that were always been in the JDK. And uh, these classes came in the JDK, therefore you never needed a dependency on those classes. Um, but because they were kind of uh, enterprise classes, but in the JDK for some kind of mistake or something, they said, oh, okay, let's you know, take everything enterprise out of OpenJDK and uh, repackage them into isolated dependencies. Let's put them into Maven Central so that people that actually need these classes can actually now add the dependency and uh, still have their uh, code work, right? So this is, for example, a typical example of a problem that you have to address uh, in the Maven uh, build configuration files, right? If you were using those classes, then you had to look up the artifacts in Maven Central and, you know, add the dependency and you had to modify uh, the POM files. Otherwise, your project doesn't even compile. More things that were added to the uh, Java 11 uh, release uh, were two new garbage collectors. And this is really, really exciting because it is the first time that new garbage collectors were added since a very long time. But these garbage collectors that were added, and we'll see one in 11 and then another one in 12, are game changer. Uh, meaning, performance-wise, if you ever had a problem of, oh, I have this long GC poses. How do I tune the garbage collector? Let me go to a conference, speak with the performance expert, or talk to a performance expert to do the tuning of G1 or CMS or whatever. 
uh, these garbage collectors fundamentally take this out of the picture and solves the problem once and for all, uh, which is really exciting. The two new garbage collectors in 11, one is called Epsilon, and uh, it does absolutely nothing. It's a garbage collector that has been introduced uh, to fundamentally be a baseline for all the other garbage collector, meaning if I want to verify what is the impact on performances of a new garbage collector, what do I compare it against, right? Well, now we have this epsilon garbage collector that fundamentally does exactly nothing. It just, whenever the heap is full, it just throws an out of memory error, doesn't do any garbage collection, but doesn't have any overhead. And that's really important for certain kind of uh, applications. For example, financial applications uh, typically start nine o'clock in the morning, close at five o'clock in the afternoon, and may run with generating very little garbage so that you can just start your job virtual machine at nine o'clock in the morning, big hip, you just let it allocate until five o'clock in the afternoon, doesn't fill the heap during that time, and at five o'clock you just turn it off and you're, you're good. And the Epsilon garbage collector is perfect because it has no overhead at all. So gives you maximum throughput. But the other one, the one that I'm most excited about is called ZGC. ZGC has been developed internally at Oracle for five years. Uh, it's a single generation, region-based, but the most interesting uh, feature of ZGC is that it is concurrent in almost every single aspect of it. So it does concurrent marking with also uh, other garbage collector already do, like for example, G1. But the one thing that does differently from all the others, it does concurrent compaction, meaning it can defragment the heap concurrently with your application still running. That was a ga the game changer. Uh, the initial goal uh, for this garbage collector, when the project was actually announced uh, publicly, uh, was to say, okay, we want uh, to keep the pauses of the garbage collector, like the stop the world pauses for the garbage collector, to be less than 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds is a really, really, really short time. It is something that is achievable with G1 and other garbage collector, but only if you apply a good amount of tuning to them. But ZGC said, ah, we have no problem. We, you know, we are a young project, uh, you know, still not battle-proofed, but uh, our goal is already 10 milliseconds all for uh, stop the work poses, which was very aggressive. And we'll see in the evolution of this how and where did it go. So performance is one of the main things in the evolution of Java. And the ZGC and the other garbage collector that are introduced is one big part of them because the platform has now become very performant. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, Java is garbage collection poses. Like it's an old mantra, became a meme. Uh, you go to other people or other languages and you know, they kind of joke on Java. Yeah, yeah, but you have uh, garbage collection poses. Sorry, no anymore. Thank you, bye. So we're good here. So the other big thing that was introduced in Java 11, which is a problem, well, not a problem, but it is something different uh, in runtime behavior, is uh, TLS 1.3. It's the newest uh, uh, TLS specification. It is slightly different from TLS 1.2. They took the chance to fundamentally remove all the uh, vulnerable and weak ciphers that are present in TLS 1.2, and uh, therefore, the behavior of these, uh, it is on by default in Java 11, and so what could happen is that if you try to connect to uh, your website uh, with a very old browser and you offload the TLS in the Java virtual machine using Java, um, then you may encounter some problem. Maybe old browsers cannot connect anymore because uh, they are so old that they propose to the server side, hey, I want to use this cipher. And the server side says, oh, look, look this guy was, wants to use the cipher, but it's weak and it's deprecated. Maybe it's even vulnerable. I'm not going to use the cipher. Uh, so it says, nope, sorry, I don't want to use the cipher. And so it sends back his own ciphers. And then the client says, oh, I don't know any of these ciphers because are the new ones, are TLS 1.3. I don't know them. And so eventually the two parties says, okay, we don't know how to communicate. And, you know, the connection just drops. So not good. 
It's not particularly common, but it may happen. It depends on you know, browsers and devices that you're using, whether they are uh, really old or not. So there's something, some work to do, as I said before. Not an easy, uh, you know, it is something that you have to test, run your stuff. It's not immediate. You know, you can go by in one hour because everything works great, but sometimes it's not that simple. Uh, this is one very interesting feature, especially for teachers, because uh, it is finally possible to run uh, a Java source file uh, directly with the Java command. So you don't need to go through Java C, and that's very easy to, you know, as a teaching tool, because you go to a student and you don't have to say, hey, look, you have to write the source code, you have now to, uh, you know, compile with Java C and put the class file in there, and then you have to run Java now to run the class file. It's, you know, it's a long step of process, and the guy goes, but I don't have to do this with Python, I don't have to do this with JavaScript, why should I do all this complication with Java? Well, finally, that is, uh, is over. Uh, the Side effect of this feature is that now you can actually write a script file. You can actually do something like shebang Java and then put the Java source code in the thing and then because of the shebang under Linux, for example, it recognizes that it's a Java file and invokes the Java interpreter to compile and run the Java code. So you can write scripts in Java like you, you could do with Python, like you, you can do with you know pretty much every other uh, uh, dynamic uh, scripting languages. And of course we close the circle because uh, we all know there's only one true language, it's called JavaScript, so we can now do JavaScript uh, in Java too, so that's cool. Uh, this is the one thing that uses uh, the Flow Reactive Streams API. Um, uh, HTTP client, it supports HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. And uh, as you can see, it's quite simple to use. Um, there's an HTTP client class. It uses the common builder pattern. You can build an HTTP client. You can you know, create a new builder. You can configure a bunch of things, build an HTTP client instance. You can do the same builder thing with, uh, with an HTTP request. And then you can just say, okay, client send this request and uh, you use the uh, reactive stream Java Util Concurrent Flow APIs to read the body in an asynchronous way uh, so that it is non-blocking. Um, this client is quite simple. Uh, it doesn't have many features. It has quite a bunch of bugs, uh, which are fixed only every six months, so not quite often. And the new features are difficult to request because it's the JDK, so they have other priorities. Uh, so. If you want to use for something very simple, for example, you want to you know, send a request to check whether a, a system is uh, still alive, like a health check, that's perfect, uh, super simple, it's already bundled in the JDK, great. If you want to do something more complex, for example, uh, a proxy, an implementation of a proxy, may not be the right choice because it's too simple. Uh, there are things that you want to be able to configure and so, yeah. Um, spoiler alert, I work for the Jetty project, therefore uh, we have an HP client which is uh, plenty of features here, so uh, you can use our own if you want to. Uh, fast forward and finally is 2019, we arrive and Java 12 is out. And Java 12 and 13 were actually like really small releases after the really huge effort that was put into putting out Java 11, uh, which was the LTS release as I told you before. Um, Java 12 fundamentally included one new garbage collector, and that was the main thing. Um, it's in, in, in an interesting way, though, because the source code of this new garbage collector developed by Red Hat was actually integrated in the mainline source tree of OpenJDK. However, it happens that Oracle binary builds of the Oracle JDK does not have it they decided to explicitly not build Shenandoah um, in their binary builds. However, fortunately, it happens that all the other vendors uh, that provide binaries for OpenJDK version 12 and forward, they all include Shenandoah. So um, if you're stuck with Oracle, uh, well, you don't have it, you don't have a, a choice to use it, but if you want to give it a go because it may be really good for your use case, well then pick another vendor and uh, you will have it. Uh, 
What's the good thing about Shenandoah? Well, it's one of those other uh, new generational, uh, sorry, not generational, but um, uh, con concurrent garbage collectors that also does concurrent compaction, like ZGC was doing. And the post times for Shenandoah are remarkable similar to those of ZGC. So fundamentally, now we don't only have one big performance impact on the platform, which is ZGC, and fundamentally the pauses are gone, but we have two of them. So if one doesn't work for you, you can totally use the other one. So for example, ZGC is better for larger machines, but Shenandoah works really, really well for smaller machines. So even if one doesn't apply to a specific use case, you can always choose the other. And that's great because it gives uh, you know, choices to the platform, which uh, you know, not many other languages and runtime give you this many choices, especially in matter of performance. But that's about Java 12. Uh, Java 13 came out later that year, and uh, there was one single thing that, 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 that I was amazed at. And they totally re-implemented TCP sockets in OpenJDK, like from scratch, basically. Of course, the API remained exactly the same, but the underlying implementation in the JDK was completely changed. And so I was very worried, because working in a project like Jetty, where we just stressed the TCP stack to a degree that it's not even you know, legal, uh, not a single test failure in the Jetty test suite after this change. And it was like, wow, they, re they did like a wonderful job. It's like there was not a single failure. And we were doing, a, I promise you, we were doing like a really nasty thing to the TCP stack uh, for testing incredible rare error conditions that we can have in Jetty that have been reported to us by our clients. And we say, okay, we need to behave better in this case. Let's write a test case and let's see how do we behave and fix the thing. Uh, of course, with every new six months release, there were more changes to existing parts of the JDK. And here, I'm just condensing Java 13 into one slide with two bullets, but there's you know, plenty of things that I'm not even saying to you. But these are the most important ones, because otherwise we'll stay here until tomorrow. And even though I have an extra 20 minutes at the end, uh, <laughs> it's way too uh, a short time to fill everything. So Java 14 now. Um, Java 13 came out just before the pandemic, and uh, for the first time, it brought in an official new change to the Java language. And uh, it's called expression switch, meaning that it is the switch keyword can now be an expression and not just a statement, okay? So it can return a value. And uh, it doesn't have any more default through default behavior. So if you forgot, remember, how many of you have forgotten to put a break in a case uh, lab, uh, block, right? Everybody, fundamentally, right? Uh, the expression switch doesn't require you to do so because by default does not fall through. And um, so, and because it has to return a value, uh, it has to enforce all cases. Who here is guilty of not putting all the cases in, you know, case blocks? I'm, for one, surely guilt. It's like, yeah, okay, we, you know, we have a, maybe a state machine. We know that the only possible state in this method are one, two, and three. We forget about four. We don't even put a default because it never happens, come on. And so, you know, it's like, okay, so, but, you know, we get by because the statement, the switch statement allows you to do that. But the expression doesn't. So here is how it works. You can do switch day of week, while well, case Saturday, comma, Sunday. Oh, there's no columns anymore. Now there's commas. And then you can see that there is an arrow that specifies that that is the expression that is being returned as the value of the switch statement. And of course, it's default arrow true. Um, Okay, but what if I want to do something more complicated than just returning an expression, right? Uh, so it, it, it becomes this way. Uh, so for, say, for example, I want a system or something. Uh, okay, so if I do, I open a brace, a block, and I do system or print and weekend, and now I have to return the value, right? How do you do this in 
Scala or Kotlin or whatever. You just say uh, the last statement of the block is the expression that is going to be returned, right? However, that doesn't work in Java because it was not born as a ex fully expression langu language, uh, programming language. And so we have to put a statement, uh, but we cannot use return false because return means exit from the function, not from the switch. So there was an initial proposal that said break false because the idea of the break was, well, break fundamentally ends the computation of this case block. So if I do break false, I means I want to return from this case and uh, with the value, right? However, break was um, in the mind of pretty much everybody was like, no, no, break is just, you know, break, like break out of here. And uh, because it was also used in for loops and while statements and so on and so forth, it's like, yeah, it doesn't, I mean, why break behaves in a way in the switch, but then, you know, not in the same way in the for, that's weird. Uh, let's use another keyword. So they came up with yield, and so now you can still return a value, but it's called yield now, and it's there. Uh, just a, a small parenthesis here, that if you have a variable in your existing code called yield, which could happen, uh, that is not a problem, because yield is not a keyword or a classical keyword. It is called a context-sensitive keyword, keyword, meaning that it only becomes a keyword when it's in the right place and in the right spot, okay? So you can still have int yield equal five. That works perfectly fine, but when you are inside a switch expression, you can do yield false, and that is interpreted in a different way by the compiler. We will see that the Java language has evolved in a way of almost always using these context-sensitive keywords uh, in next features that we will see in a few slides. By far, this is the most exciting feature that has ever been added to the Java platform, helpful null pointer exceptions. Because finally, when a null pointer exception gets thrown, it tells you what is it that was null. Uh, so you can actually see here, you can see cannot read field A because C dot B, that was now, and so now it's really helpful. And, and I'm not joking, uh, there was a poll about this feature, and all the features that were introduced in Java 14 and previews, and this, far, this feature here won by a large margin. It's like everybody loved it. Um, one small tier here for me especially, because I love garbage collectors, um, the CMS garbage collector was actually removed from the source tree because uh, it was fundamentally stable but unmaintained, and it was now outclassed by the new garbage collectors. So, you know, sorry, but yes, it went away. Which brings us to Java 15 and uh, a new feature in Java, finally, text blocks. Um, what is it, a text block? It's fundamentally just a string, but on multi-lines, right? And you don't have to, for example, who has written here JSON and has put like a bazillion escape for the double quotes, right? It's horrible to do it. Okay, so text blocks allows you to do exactly, uh, to avoid exactly this. So you can start a text block with three double quotes, the orange ones at the top, and then inside that, you can use other strings, but without the need for escaping them, right? And at the end of every line, there is an automatic uh, backslash n, a uh, line feed uh, that uh, gets added to it. So fundamentally, a text block is nothing more than a string. And uh, if, if I have to write the string as if it was a normal string, I would have done like the, the line below, right? I would have to back... Uh, slash all the quotes, and uh, you know that, that is quite unreadable with the backslash n in the middle. It's unreadable, where is my string starting? Where is it finishing? I don't know. Text block is so much readable, so much more readable, and it's a good addition. So uh, it also handles uh, margins, and uh, so in the margin uh, decision is made by the closing 
three double quotes uh, mark of text blocks, right? So if you put the closing of the text block three spaces away, well then that means that those three spaces uh, should not be counted. So every time you go on a next line, you have to remove those, this initial three spaces. Um, there are special cases that have been added as well to insert a white space and to remove a new line. Uh, these are very common. So for example, if I have this text block here that says select star from users, um, and if I want to remove the new line because I want everything in a single line without uh, you know, uh, new lines in it, uh, then I have to basically say, well, okay, I need to put a space after the star and then I want to remove the new line and then when that gets rendered in a string, then there's no syn syntax error in the SQL, right? Because if I don't add the space, it's going to be select star from, and there is no space between the star and the from, and so it's a syntax error for SQL. So you can do these things. Uh, it's quite flexible. And the following, what they've done with the TCP sockets, they totally re-implemented the UDP sockets. Uh, again, totally transparent for applications, just the implementation in the JDK was completely rewrote. And uh, maybe next year, I'll be here talking to you about another good thing that came uh, and was actually triggering these uh, rewrites that is Project Loom, but that is for the next year. Finally, ZGC and Shenandoah, after you know, waiting a few years from Java 11 to Java 15, that's about two years, they became production ready. Means that they could still crash, but you can run the most taxing uh, benchmarks that you can have for the Java platforms and they don't crash and they give very good performance. So, you know, now they're production ready, they're, you don't need fancy command line options to enable them, uh, you know, they're there. And then a small tier here again for me because they removed Nazorn, which was the JavaScript implementation in the Java, uh, in OpenJDK. Uh, it was removed because uh, fundamentally, even though it was a incredibly important project uh, when it first came into the Java platform because it allowed to implement the invoke dynamic features of the Java platform, which after in Java 7, which were then used in Java 8 to implement the lambdas. So this project was of paramount importance to understand how the lambda mechanism was uh, needed to be designed, and the JavaScript implementation make that a, you know, uh, a really good help for the general mechanism. Unfortunately, it was very costly to maintain, especially also because JavaScript is a rapidly evolving language, and the cost of maintaining and keeping up to date with the specification of JavaScript was too much, so it was removed. Finally, we arrive to much more meteor um, releases. Java 16 is one of those, and Java 17 is another one. But Java 16 first um, makes the appearance this apparently small feature. Uh, it's called the pattern matching for instance of. And what you can do is that you can bind a variable name, an identifier, to the expression of the instance of. So you can say, if object instance of my class that, and that is the name of a variable that gets assigned to a cast down my class for object. So it already has the type of my class. Because if instance of uh, resolves as a true expression, then that gets bound to that expression, all right? Well, okay, so that's how you use it. You can use it in the block where the instance of is uh, true, right? Uh, so, for example, you can use it uh, in equals, very useful, but you can use in some kind of checks where here you say, ah, I want to, ch uh, you know, check whether the certificate that I get in is an X509 certificate, and I want to, ch you know, call some specific X509 method on the variable if the instance of is true. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, for example, if you invert the condition of the if, uh, that, the variable that, is available outside of the block. So it is natural because, well, if the instance of fails, whatever is inside the block 
doesn't have that bound because it's not an instance of uh, the, the matched. So, but the rest of the block, yes, it means that it matched. So I can use the, that variable, right? And of course, it also works with the Boolean logic. So obviously, it works with the end operator because if instance of and something else, it means that the first one is already true and therefore I can use the variable in the second part. But doesn't, of course, work with the or statement because if the first one is false, only then I go and try to evaluate the second. And then if it is false, I cannot have the variable bound at that point. Um, the next uh, really interesting feature in Java 16 are records. And uh, what are records? Records are fundamentally immutable, final, it's important, you cannot extend the record, data holder classes. They're basically tuples with a type or with a name, if you want to call it that way. So for example, this is a full definition of a record. Public record min max, int min, int max, open brace, close brace, that's it. You don't have to add anything else here. Uh, what this record gives you, like if you look at the definition of this class, it's like, well, it's clear. It's a min max and it has two fields. One is exactly called min and not minimum. The other one is exactly called max and not maximum. Uh, I mean, it's all there, right? This is really, really important because it creates like a one-to-one -one relationship between the record and the data that it holds. Now, the purist of object orientation would say, oh, but that's really wrong because where is my data hiding, right? Uh, well, there's no data hiding. Uh, that's exactly what a record is. It is there as a data holder and its only purpose is to give a name to a bunch of fields. So there's no data hiding. You actually want to make those fields uh, visible and clearly visible. And we will see how this becomes really important in the future. Uh, so you can use it in this way. You can have a field way of accessing them. You can have a method way of accessing them. You can have uh, method references. They can be customized. Uh, let's see a couple of customizations here. So for example, you have uh, the first one looks like a constructor, but you see there are the parentheses missing, kind of. That is called the compact constructor, and you can actually do some uh, validation logic. But you can also have custom constructor, for example, the one that takes a histogram as a parameter. You can add static methods. You can add uh, uh, other uh, virtual methods to the, to the record. Um, but don't try to you know, override the existing methods that the record provides for you, right? Because that it's going to be hiding, and it's going to be like a, a nightmare to figure out. So they're quite flexible, they, you know, and customizable in a way, but they're a super simple concept, right? What's the use case for record? Well, um, typical use case would be return multiple values. How do you return, for example, you have an int array, I give it to a function to calculate the minimum and the maximum. How do you return the minimum and the maximum? You, I, it's complicated because, I mean, I can return the minimum, but then how do I return the maximum, right? I have to pass in another parameter which would be an output parameter, even if it's an input, where I store the maximum. And that would have been like an int array of dimension one. It's uh, horrible, right? But with records, it becomes really clear because also they are much more expressive than just pair int int. Because in pair int int, the first one is the minimum or it is the maximum. You, you don't know, it doesn't tell. But min max, tells you because it's min max, but, but, but then it doesn't matter because you have a method called mean and if you want the minimum, you just call the method mean and it's super clear. They can be used as DTOs, uh, but obviously not as JPA entities because they are immutable. So JPA entities are obviously mutable, so cannot use record in there. Um, but the nice thing is that they can be used as temporary tuples. Uh, who knows here about method local classes? Oh, oh, only three, four of you? Well, this is possible since a long time. You can define a class inside a method. But now you can also do this with records. 
So for example, you have a very long method, complicated, you have to run like a, you know, an incredible difficult logic or something like that, and you need some kind of helper classes. Typically you do, okay, I need some kind of helper class, I wanna put it like at the end of the file and hope that I remember how to use it and everything, but what if the class is, you know, just a simple record holder, I need to carry over, over a stream transformation, these, uh, you know, values, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, let me put the record exactly when I need it, right, inside the method where I'm actually using it. And uh, so you can actually do this kind of things now. So you can take a string, uh, calculate its length, but carry over both the length and the string, and the string, and then you can remap back to one of the two and, uh, you know, whatever. So uh, they are quite useful. Um, with the occasion, in order to make records available as record local classes, uh, well, no, sorry, method local records, um, they lifted a couple of restrictions that were present until Java 16, which were, uh, for example, the fact that you could not define static things inside non-static inner classes. That was really annoying, and it happened to me like a million times. Uh, and, but now you can. I mean, it was like weird, uh, why can I not do a static in, inside an inner class, right? Uh, but this has been lifted with the work that has been done for records, which again goes and says uh, something very interesting about the Java platform because they think these things through. They say, well, okay, if we have, you know, a, an occasion to improve the language or reduce the boilerplate and do things in a better way, will take it and will improve the language and, and go on, uh, you know, and improve the life of millions of developers. So that's really cool. Um, one thing that uh, it's really interesting for records, and this is a feature that will come to Java, it's not there yet, is that because they exactly define a one-to-one -one relationship between the data and the record, okay, so in the data that, that makes up the record, okay, it would be really easy for the JVM runtime to understand and deconstruct a record. Why is that? Well, because the JVM knows exactly, for example, if I ask you how many fields had the min max class, you would say immediately, well, two, min and max. Okay, so the JVM also knows that. So it knows exactly that that class has two fields and it can be deconstructed in those two fields and that from those two fields, I can build another record that, that looks exactly the same as the previous one that I've just deconstructed. So there's a strict one-to-one -one relationship in there. Well, which is not there, for example, in a class like this one, percentile. If I just give you class percentile, how many fields does it have? Well, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know until you actually look at the whole source code of the class, and that may not be you know, trivial to understand either. However, if I give you this record class and says in P50, P90, P95, and P99, you know immediately it has four fields and you can only get out those four percentiles and not others, right? So it's very clear this one-to-one -one relationship. In a future version of Java, well, you can do a pattern matching of instance of in this way. You can say, well, okay, if it's a percentile and it's a record, I can deconstruct the record into four variables called here A, B, C, D, and I can bind them exactly to the values that are uh, composing that record, okay? And this will basically make Java much more closer to languages that already have this deconstructing features, like, for example, Kotlin and Scala. It will be available eventually in the future. Right? Um, so it's a small thing. Well, you can say, well, it's a, yeah, it's a tuple. Okay, how complicated can it be? Yes, but it's a tuple with a great potential because it would allow for deconstruction. Um, in an even future Java version, not only the pattern matching for instance of, but you can also use it as a pattern matching for switch expressions, right? So you can say, well, I'm gonna switch on this object. Is it a percentile? Yes, bind all the variables and then just return a JSON containing the P50. Thank you, done, okay? 
one unrelated kind of thing that was there, um, eh, kind of, for example, for us in Jerry, this was a very, very required feature. We had a ton of people requesting, oh, can I use Unix domain sockets with Jerry? And uh, the answer was always, eh, no. <laughs> Even though there were libraries that we could use, those libraries were not stable, and therefore, you know, we kind of waited for Java 16 to introduce the support for Unix domain sockets in the platform. For example, our own website, the, the company webtie.com, runs exactly in this way. We have a jetty in the front, it does TLS uh, offloading, and forwards the HTTP calls to a WordPress backend through Unix domain sockets. Um, now, the question is, whose other very popular server does this? If you ever deployed Apache on Nginx, they do exactly the same thing. You put Apache in the front and you say, OK, Apache, you do the TLS offloading. Then you call the backend WordPress using Unix domain. Uh, Nginx does the same, and now Jetty can do the same, and pretty much everything, every other you know, server container or web server written in Java can now do that. So it's, well, for us, is kind of eating our own dog food, but it is a good potential to have it in the platform. Plus, it's super easy to use. As you can see, this is a full example, and it's five lines, and so super easy to use. Um, this slide almost didn't make it into the presentation because it was saying, yeah, I mean, they added another tool called JPackage, what's the big deal, whatever. Uh, but then I got an incredible feedback from almost everybody that I spoke to and say, yeah, should I you, you know, add JPackage when I present Java 16? I say, absolutely, yes, it's a, it's a game changer. Uh, but why? Well, because it creates um, Deb, and RPMs, packages, and MSI, and EXE, and package, and DMGs for all the three operative systems. And you can actually embed your application with your server, with your, your dependencies, and with everything you need into a binary that you can install. Uh, so with, for example, with a specific Java version that you actually need in your platform, right? Your product only supports Java 11, Great, you do JPackage, put in Java 11, put in your uh, application, package everything, you give this to customers and say, hey, just double click on the thing and it will install itself and uh, you're good to go. It is configurable, you can say where things get to be installed and you know, it's super nice. If you have a distribution problem, like you're distributing your products, like you know, go to my site and download the, the version that you need to install in your operative system kind of problem. Go and look at JPackage because it already solves the problem for you. It's not anymore like, oh, I need, uh, remember what was the other thing that was doing this? It was um, the tool that allowed you to download the applets and, and everything. It was security issues everywhere. Now you just download the file, you have prepackaged it, it and it works great. Finally, Java 17, it's 2021. It's been three years from the last LTS release and Java 17 is the new LTS release, great. But what, what is LTS? Um, you know, I left this from before. And so, well, LTS is just fundamentally a marketing concept. There is absolutely no difference between Java 16 and Java 17 in terms of importance or stability or performance or whatever. Um, from the OpenJDK point of view, right? The OpenJDK open source project says, okay, we're going to cut the release for a major one. It's gonna be super stable, has to pass a lot of tests, and it's stable as hell, right? Just so happened that Oracle says, well, but we have these releases every six months. We cannot really support all of them forever or you know, all of them for a long period of time. So let's just put a stamp in one, you know, some of those and mark those as long-term support releases, right? Uh, 17 was marked as long-term support release because when 11 came out, Oracle said, well, uh, this is a 11, is the LTS, and the next one is gonna be in three years. Thank you, see you in three years. Okay, uh, 
uh, well, when 17 came out, Oracle came up and said, oh, okay, so we change our minds. It's not anymore every three years now. It's every two years. Uh-oh. Uh, so now something has changed. And, uh, you know, that's really important because I'm telling you, we have already, in September, uh, it's going to be Java 19 out. One year from that is going to be Java 21. Java 21 is going to be the next LTS support release. And if I come back here next year and giving this presentation or something similar to you, and I still see someone that raises his hand because he's still on Java 8, I'm going to kick his ass because, <laughs> come on, guys. I mean, you can't be like, it's 21 next year, right? And it's an LTS support release. So you have to understand that you have to upgrade, okay? You have to make this effort to upgrade. You cannot stay on Java 8 forever. It's not possible. And I'll give you more jokes and examples later so we have some laugh because the, the day is ending. So uh, let's see what it's new in Java 17. Let's go back to the presentation. So obviously, the Oracle lawyers, and this is another joke, couldn't resist. Why don't we make a new license for Java 17? Of course, it's called, uh, don't even recall, NFTC, no fee terms and condition. Go trying to read it, probably the only person in the room here be able to understand what that license means is you know, our previous speaker, because it was, she was a lawyer. But good luck trying to, you know, uh, trying to figure it out. Kelly can, but you know, I, don't even ask me, because I went there and says, oh, you can use it for internal purposes. What does internal mean? There's no definition of internal. Then you go and there is a definition for external. Well, but it's like, like a complete complementary of internal, or it's you know something slightly different than internal, uh, the negative internal, or it's it's weird. Fortunately, um, uh, there are other vendors. You don't have to download the Oracle JDK. Um, and you can download other open source version of um, the JDK or versions that have a clearer uh, license. Even though, I mean, you can go and, you know, if you're bound to Oracle, go and download the Oracle one. That's great. But my recommendation is typically go and download the adoption, Tamarin, which is under the, um, it's binary, uh, binary distribution of OpenJDK under the Eclipse Foundation umbrella. Right? So you know that there is a foundation behind, you know that there are the um, foundation lawyers that have checked out all the T's and you know, dotted all the E's and, and, and everything license-wise, but it comes with a friendlier or more known open source license. So go to adoption.net, download the binaries from there, they are awesome. So stick with that or what you know, Oracle is good as well. Spring 6, we require Java 17. Jetty 12, we require Java 17. We are already writing Jetty 12 using Java 17. And I can tell you, it's wonderful. Number one feature that we like the most, to me at least, switch expression. Number two features seems like crazy, but we do quite a bit of instance of because we have to do reflections and stuff in order to pull up a servlet and, and things like that. And we have lots of instance of around the jetty code. And uh, you know, the pattern matching for instance of is great. Uh, records, we don't use those that much, but they're great too. So it, it is becoming really like a joy to uh, work in Java 17 and other libraries, of course, because the big elephant in the room is Spring. And if Spring says, oh, I'm going to support, uh, you know, Java 17 from now on, what do you think the, all the other libraries will do? We'll say, oh, okay, <laughs> we're also going to, you know, require as a minimum Java 17 because next year is already 21 and it's already the next LTS, LTS release. So don't stay back because the train is going faster and faster and faster. Um, so, maybe later for discussion, why do you upgrade Java, right? Because of new features, you want to leverage the new features, you want to have, uh, you know, you want to wait until you have library support until before upgrading to Java, other. But let me ask you a question. So, so for example, when do you upgrade Spring? Who is here in Spring 3? Nobody. Who is in Spring 4? Nobody. Who is in Spring 5? 
why did you upgrade to Spring 5, but you're still on Java 8? Why? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. How, who here, when an operative system patch comes in and says, hey, there's a new kernel, who does not install the new kernel and says, oh, maybe I should you know, install the new kernel because it comes with performance and security things. Who does not say, oh, no, 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 I am not upgrading. Who, do, who does that? Right. Nobody. It's like, okay, you upgrade the kernel, you upgrade Spring, you upgrade every other library, but you stay back with Java? It doesn't make any sense. So move forward with Java as well. That's, you know, mandatory. Java 17 deprecated the security manager uh, for removal. Who's here is using the security manager? One, two. Okay. Well, prepare for that because it's going to be gone like, and really, really soon. So, unfortunately, the decision couldn't be discussed or taken back. Oracle decided unilaterally. It's too costly. It's a source of security issues. And so it's really important for us to not have security issues. Therefore, security manager is gone. And fundamentally, the analysis that they did was, well, the security manager was giving a false sense of security because it was catching some things, but there were plenty of ways of working it around. If you really wanted to attack the Java platform, even with a security manager installed, you could. So, you know, it's gone. Couple of minor things. JDK internals are strongly encapsulated now. There's no way for you to do reflection on JDK internals anymore. Over. Like, not even if you do command line fancy options. Gone. Uh, new rendering pipeline for macOS called, uh, I don't remember the name, but it's, yeah. The, the previous one uh, is based on OpenGL, uh, was deprecated now using Metal, which is a library uh, for macOS. The last interesting feature that I wanted to talk to you about of Java 17 are sealed classes. And here comes again another context-sensitive keyword, a new one called sealed. What does that mean? It means that the celestial interface here can only have three implementations, and that's it. So it is a way to close the class hierarchy uh, with the aim of helping in the design of things, all right? We will see a, a couple of examples of this. Uh, so celestial permits star, planet, and satellite. Okay, well, one implementation, of course, is planet, and uh, it has to be a final class, so you cannot extend planet anymore. Or it can be a non-sealed class, star, which you can extend at wish, like it's not sealed anymore. So you can have an infinite number and, uh, you know, runtime, dynamic, whatever, uh, implementation of stars, because we don't know uh, how many different stars are there in the universe. Um, and uh, you can also, you know, rec recursively seal the other implementations. So you can say, okay, uh, a satellite I want it to be sealed again because it can only be a natural satellite or an artificial satellite. So I want to seal the hierarchy again and allow only these two implementations, which, by the way, are these two final classes, and that's it. So it seems like, a, eh, where is it that I'm going to use this? But um, it's, it's quite interesting, though, because, for example, the Java runtime can make a lot of optimization if you use these features. Because it can say, hey, here I have a virtual call on an interface called Celestial. I know that Celestial can only be permits three implementation. So you know what? In the bytecode, rather than doing some you know, weird stuff that I, can, I cannot figure out, I can say, well, OK, I'm going to do an optimization where I can say, well, it's type 1, type 2, or type 3, else error, right? And that if and else uh, becomes very efficient because I can skip one jump of looking up into a virtual table and then coming back and doing a full virtual call. Um, so it's important for the runtime. But it's way, way, way more important the feature is actually being designed for the design of Java applications. Uh, so, for example, uh, how would you implement classically a shape get area, right? 
uh, you would say, oh, okay, like, you know, object-oriented would say, well, you put an abstract method into interface shape, and then every different concrete implementation would override uh, get area and, uh, you know, implement their own version of it. However, if you know that there can only be circles and rectangles, you can just implement, um, so this is the typical implementation, right, abstract method. Uh, but if you know that there are only two implementations, well, now you can do it in this way. You can do switch circle, uh, this, right? And then case circle, again, this is a future Java version where you can do the pattern matching uh, in the switch thing with the deconstruction. You can write it in this way, very concise, very simple, in the base class, you know, super simple. Less boilerplate, less abstract method, less go to 24, you know, 25s to look where the method has been implemented because it's everything in the base class. Of course, records uh, and sealed classes work really well together because you can say record, remember, is a final class. And so because when you use sealed classes or interfaces, the uh, descendant of that sealed class can only be either final or non-sealed or sealed, right? So there's this constraint. Well, records are final classes, so they match one of the constraints. That's great. And so here's the way that you would implement, for example, an abstract syntax tree. You have an expression, but it can only permit a number of implementations. In this case, just add and const. Um, you know, you do two records, and again, in the future Java version, you can do switch. What kind of expression it is? It is a const, it is an add, do the logic, done. So, super easy to, to do. This almost looks like Scala code, right? And uh, it's less boilerplate, it's very easy to read, and uh, it nat comes natural. So, it's cool. Um, all right, conclusions. Java 17, lots of good stuff, performance, great, features, great, uh, major libraries moving to Java 17, and there's another uh, discussion that I want to take, right? For, so, for example, uh, if you own a business and you will, or, you know, you're, you're a developer and you're looking for people, right? Okay, so there's a new candidate coming out of the university, comes here to you and says, uh, oh, uh, what do you do? Um, yeah, we do this product and, uh, you know, we work in the market uh, of finance or whatever. And then the candidate asks you, oh, but on what Java version are you using? And you're going to say, oh, we're using Java 8. And it's like, what? Because, uh, you know, I know the 17 is out. Uh, you know what? In an hour, I have another interview to another company and they use Java 17. Now I'm asking you, guess <laughs> what a new out of the university uh, thing, maybe, you know, it will not pick your job because you're working with obsolete 10 plus years old technology for fundamentally no reason, okay? So think twice, at thrice, like four times about staying in Java 8 because you really don't want to. It's like, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's not good for you. Like in a number of things, it's like, okay, so how many of you are on the cloud here? Like de deploying Java stuff on the cloud. Okay, so you pay for what you consume. Okay, so if you put Java 17 in there, you pay less because this, the platform is freaking more performant. So you pay less. So, so th there's no reason. <laughs> and that's the last time that I say it. All right, so upgrade to Java 17. You have to be organized to do this because it's not super easy. And don't accumulate technical debt. It attracts, if you move to Java 17, it attracts new developers. Uh, and the train is going faster. If today you move to Java 17, then in one year, you will be ready to move to Java 29, uh, 21, okay? Maybe not in the source code, maybe yes, but maybe not, okay? So you still keep using only the Java 17 features, but the runtime is Java 21, which may have much better performance than 17. So, and you keep attracting developers because you say, hey, uh, you know, we're using Java 21 here. How many are using Java 21? Not many, so it's, it's a good thing for 
attracting people uh, and coming to you. And as I said, the, the train goes fast now because next year in September is going to be the next LTS. But then, you know, obviously there will be, you know, we're waiting for the meteorite to arrive on Earth and cause another big disruption in the next two years. But in two years' time, it's going to be another <laughs> Java long-term support release in three years, right from now. And so the train is going really fast. You, you really don't, do not want to stay back. So... That's it. Thank you for listening. Now, so I know we have a couple more minutes, I guess. Um, if you have any questions, uh, there's a microphone there. Otherwise, you know, we're around. There's a meet and greet now. I think after Alessandra will close the conference. So thank you for listening.